Alrighty. Hello, everyone. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, please wait a few moments uh, while we wait for everybody to join the event. We'll get started here in just a moment. If you're just joining us, we are waiting a few moments um, for folks to join and get settled in in the webinar. Um, and we appreciate you being here today. So just hang on a minute and we'll get started here soon. We still have some folks coming in. All righty. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm going to ahead and get started while some people still trickle in. Um, we'll start with some introductions. Um, my name is Natalie Rudd. I am the Learning and Engagement Manager here at the National Women's Hall of Fame. Um, I'll be doing some quick housekeeping before I turn things over to Dr. Kim Syatt, who is our moderator this evening. I'm going to start with some brief um, housekeeping details. Um, following today's panel discussion, um, which will discuss um, the intersection between two incredible women, um, Harriet Tubman and Emily Howland, um, we will be hosting a live Q&A session. You'll be able to ask our panelists questions about some of the topics they discuss. You can submit your questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen at any time throughout the chat and we will throughout the discussion and we will save them for the very end. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, we recommend leaving and then rejoining the lecture completely. And that being said, tonight's webinar is being recorded and all registrants of the event will receive an email tomorrow morning with a link to the recording where you can watch it or rewatch it at any time. Our events are also equipped with closed captioning. Um, you have the power to change the size of the closed captions. You can turn them on or off using the closed caption button on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom. And in the event's follow-up email, you will also be asked to fill out a brief survey at the end of this event as well. And we please ask that you take just a few minutes to fill it out. Your feedback is extremely helpful and important as we continue to grow and improve our virtual events here at the National Women's Hall of Fame. And as you all know, today's event is free and these virtual events are critical to our continuing our not-for-profit mission of showcasing great women and inspiring all. And this includes making the Hall's events accessible for all learners, and that includes those with limited physical abilities or lack of financial means. So please consider making a donation to the National Women's Hall of Fame um, as a nonprofit by visiting our website to show your support. Truly, every dollar helps. We continue, can continue offering these for free. And then finally, if you enjoy tonight's event, you want to learn more about the National Women's Hall of Fame, please consider signing up for our e-newsletter where you will be the first to know about any and all upcoming events, which we have a ton of coming up in 2022. Um, you'll be the first to know about them and you'll have lots of opportunities to get involved. Um, events to donate and sign up for the newsletter, all those links will be included in that follow-up email that you will receive tomorrow morning. Um, so without further ado, I'm excited to give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Kim Syed, Director of the National Portrait Gallery. Kim, I'll let you take it from here. Thanks so much, Natalie. Good evening, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here as we welcome Emily into the National Women's Hall of Fame and, of course, revisit with Harriet Tubman. Um, our panellists tonight are extraordinary, and I think you're going to enjoy everything they have to say. Uh, Marilyn Post is the research specialist for the Howland Stone Store Museum that is in uh, Emily's hometown of Sherwood in New York. Uh, Helena Zinkham, who is the Director for Collections and Services and the Chief of Prints and Photographs at the Library of Congress. And Ashley Curran, my colleague, who is also the Women's History Content and Interpretation curator at the National Portrait Gallery, but she also serves a larger role across the wider Smithsonian, bringing women's stories that have been hidden from history forward. 
So um, the Library of Congress did a fantastic little video about the Howland album that Natalie is going to play for you now that gives you a little bit of a context of why this is so important to be talking about now. Thank you. Howland album is an album that was gifted to Emily Howland from Carrie Nichols. It's full of carte de visite photographs, which are two inch by four inch album and photographs of her family and friends, fellow Quakers, educators, abolitionists. And one of the prizes in the album is a portrait of Harriet Tubman that was previously unrecorded. The Library of Congress jointly acquired the album with the National Museum of African American History and Culture. So we worked together with the preservation, and then I worked um, along with Jennifer Evers to, to treat the album and prepare it for exhibition and preservation. So when the album came to us, it was damaged in such a way that the front board and the spine were attached to each other, but that part was detached from the backboard. And so there was nothing supporting the pages as they were turning. And that's kind of typical damage that you would expect to see on an album like this. So on this one, I ended up using very thin strips of leather over cloth textile to repair my outer joints because I knew this is an album that's going to be getting a lot of use, especially because the Harriet Tubman photo is on the last page. That last backboard is going to be opening a lot. Alicia, the photo conservator, and I kind of got really interested in all of the different sitters and their lives. And so it was just this amazing time capsule. Photographs can speak to us about history. It really inspired me to learn more about her and about a lot of the other people that were in the album as well. It was really great working with all of the people from the Smithsonian. It was a really easy working relationship. Like everyone very much had the interest of the album at heart. Just amazing. This book has been digitized. So all of the photos are going online so that anyone can access them from anywhere. I hope people will come and see the photo album and, and maybe be a little compelled to learn more about Harriet Tubman. And, and all these really incredible people, like even the people that you haven't heard of before have these incredible stories. I think that's one of the most exciting things that we do as conservators is make it so other people can experience these things. And now it's all back together. <laughs> So tonight we are going to talk about two amazing women. One is a household dame, Harriet Tubman, and the other a relative unknown, Emily Howland. The difference in the public awareness concerning their achievements is actually interestingly reflected in the fact that Harriet was only inducted into what Harriet was inducted into the very first Women's Hall of Fame in 1973, while Howland is only just getting her due this year. In fact, the wider world only came to learn more about Howland in 2017 when her Carte de Visite album containing 53 portraits came up for auction and it excited the, world, the worlds of art and history and was, as you saw, eventually co-purchased by the Library of Congress and the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. As Lonnie Bunch, the now secretary of the Smithsonian noted to the Washington Post, quote, it's a distinct honor to have these photographs that tell an important part of America's history, end quote. As the director of the portrait gallery based at the Smithsonian, I was instantly intrigued about the source of the Tubman picture. And this was an interest that eventually led me to undertake almost two years of research into Emily Howland's use of portrait photography and the Howland album in particular. I'm presently working on a book that will be published by Princeton University Press titled Facing New Freedoms, Emily Howland's Album and the Struggle to Remake America. Harriet Tubman, interestingly, is the only person to be included in the album twice. An early picture, the, the one that we saw of her when she's estimated to be about 47 years of age on the last page, 
and an older collodion print that was tucked into the back of the album that was taken by Harvey Lindsay in around 1871 and reprinted 20 years later, which I think is a testament to the fact that Emily Howland much admired Harriet Tubman. So it's now my pleasure to lead a conversation with esteemed group of scholars and museum professionals about Emily Howland this year's honoree, her album and her relationship with Harriet Tubman over a period of around 60 years. And I'm also going to show you a few images along the way after each of our speakers talk so we can uh, get as a visual specialist, I always like having lots of pictures. So I'm going to start with Marilyn Post, the research specialist at the Howland Stone Store Museum. And Marilyn, I want to ask you first to tell us a little bit about who Emily Howland was. I know that she was born in 1827 and she died in 1929. So she lived to be an extraordinary 101 years of age. But tell us who was Emily? Because I think most people have never heard of her until now. Well, Emily's life is fascinating. Um, she was profoundly interested in people and in learning. Uh, the area around this little town of Sherwood was at the time a heavily Quaker area. Her grandparents had settled here at post-revolutionary war and held the first Quaker meeting in, in their house. Uh, the Quaker involvement uh, led Emily's family uh, to be very active in abolitionist circles and to really work hard uh, to support anyone who was moving north. And uh, Quakers, of course, believed that all people had a divine spark within themselves and that everyone was equal. Emily didn't have to come to the feeling that people were equal by life experiences, she grew up with it, uh, within her family, which I think is, is important. Uh, she also acquired practical knowledge of business, farm and home management, uh, and interested herself very much in her father's abolitionist activities. She was, I, I think you could say a daddy's girl without stretching the point. And her father sometimes even took her to abolitionist meetings. Uh, and she learned to read at an early age at her grandfather's knee. And her grandfather handed out pamphlets to, to schools too. Uh, and that was, you know, just very, very important to her. And she always did want to be involved. Uh, her father Slocum was a successful merchant and entrepreneur, and he was an active facilitator of the Underground Railroad. Uh, we don't know who all his connections were, of course, because that's part of the railroad, but uh, one of the families that we have a ticket, which we'll see later, that came from uh, two brothers who were traveling, uh, and that one of them settled here. And another family settled here just on the other side of the house where I'm now sitting, uh, in the 1840s, went to Canada for a while in the 1850s, and uh, then came back here. And that was the Phillips family. Uh, and they lived in this area and are buried in the, the cemetery across the street. It's a little tentative, but it's, it's interesting to think about the fact that they came from Maryland, as did Harriet Tubman, and later had connections with her, also the, the descendants. Um, Emily herself studied with radical Quaker Susanna Marriott and went for a time to Philadelphia, uh, forming lasting ties with Mary Grew, Margaret Burley, Carolyn Putnam, Sally Holly, and other feminist abolitionists. She corresponded regularly with them and returned often to attend lectures in Philadelphia and which was, of course, also a center for abolition. She spent some time at home keeping her parents happy uh, in her early 20s, but tired of the routines of housekeeping and the limited scope in that she could do from here. I mean, she did arrange for packages and 
bundles to be sent to some of the, to Western Ontario, to some of the areas where uh, people who had escaped to Canada were, were living. And they're quite, that's quite interesting too, because sometimes people tried to scam them. Uh, so she decided that she needed to do something. And with the help of Frances Seward, William Seward's wife, uh, she honed her teaching skills and took a position at Martilla Minor School in Washington, DC for the daughters of free people of color. Um, there she met Emma Brown, whose picture we'll see later. And it really convinced her even, even though she already believed in equality and that all people could accomplish things, it really, it really just made her so totally convinced that she was ready to convince the world. Uh, she did return home from Washington uh, after a time. And then uh, during the Civil War, went back to Washington to originally to teach in the camps where people who had been enslaved were uh, residing in Camp Todd, eventually Arlington, as well as Mason's Island. And there people were sick. She did some nursing. She got involved in the organization. She's listed as a matron in um, documents of the Freedmen's Bureau. Um, and eventually she did start some schools and, and teach also. And she may have run across Harriet Tubman during that time, we just, I don't know for sure. And Harriet's presence is, uh, it's probable, especially with the Seward connection that both of them have had, that they did run across each other there. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, Emily convinced her father to purchase 400 acres in Northern Virginia, where she did her own 40 acres in a mule. And with families that she had met in the, in the camps that she thought would do well, she took them out to Northumberland County to Heath, Heathsville and uh, they got their land. She arranged so they could pay for it over time. She built a school that was the Howland Chapel School. And it was her intention to actually live there also. And she built a house for herself, although she couldn't live there very long as her mother got ill and she was forced to, to return home. Um, but she stayed involved with that school throughout her whole life. Uh, and, and very often did a little micromanaging and made sure she hired the teachers too. So they were all good Quakers. But uh, she, she always, <laughs> she's kind of a funny character as well. Uh, so back in Sherwood, um, she reestablished some of the connections she had with the Quaker group of names, some of the names we've heard of. Uh, Lucretia Mott's sister, Martha Coffin Wright, lived in Auburn, which is not far away. And her daughter, Eliza Wright Osborne, was a good friend of Emily's throughout her life and provided a connection to Harriet because Harriet wasn't a correspondent. Um, so in that period of time, they, the women did have some contact. At one time, Harriet stayed for a few days with Slocum, Slocum and Emily after she was uh, scammed and attacked not too far from here, which is, is kind of interesting. Uh, so she recuperated in right here in Sherwood. And uh, they also met occasionally in Auburn. Uh, at one point, Emily provided a little money to Eliza to send, send uh, Harriet to Baltimore for a visit because she didn't think she was looking quite as well as she should. So Emily got, as she connect, reconnected with all the people that were in Auburn that were connected with uh, suffrage, she got a little more involved in women's rights, saying, of course, that women's rights grew automatically out of uh, the work that they had done in abolition, providing rights for everybody. 
So Emily, and, I'm going to, uh, I'm sorry, um, Marilyn, I'm going to stop you right there. This is really fascinating. And I know that um, others are going to follow on from your lead, but um, I want to show everybody a few pictures um, and just to put them in context, because you know this area so well, you, I think you literally live around the corner. So I'm, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. So um, Marilyn, this is the Howland Stone Store Museum, right? And it's literally made out of stones. It's called the Stone Store Museum because it's made out of stones. And it was in fact the storefront that Slocum Howland um, actually operated out of. And of course they're right close to where the Erie Canal is making the access of durable goods possible to West, thanks to Westward expansion. And slowly over time, he makes a great deal of money making in fact, um, upon his death, um, Emily, a very wealthy woman. She ends up giving most of it away to causes. I think upon her death, she's estimated to be supporting at least 50 schools. And you can see this house that's actually just down the road as really rather large that she was able to afford because of that money. Um, but she does um, build a school next door to it. And she puts up, as you said, she had quite the personality. She puts up teachers who were there to teach at the school. So she's sort of always with them, but there's this little marker out the front. Um, let me just go on to the next one. Um, so uh, Marilyn, you talked about the fact that it is proven and often we find with stops on the Underground Railroad that there, it's sort of, people can never prove whether in fact a location truly was a stop or not. But in this case, we have this really remarkable um, document that is in the Howland Stone Store Museum collection uh, from a gentleman called John Mann dated to 1840 saying, I quote, I have mailed uh, two, pass two passengers, excuse me for the typo there. I've mailed two passengers to thee in the Shanks horse diligence, baggage free and at risk of owners, which was code to say that there were two fugitive slaves being uh, shuttled to Slocum for protection. And as uh, Marilyn mentioned, you know, Emily grew up in an area just not too far from the border of Canada where um, a number of freed families actually settled. And when they were um, uh, possibly uh, going to be outed, they went cross back into the border of Canada for a while until they came back and they, when they felt it was safe. So she was, uh, she knew African-Americans and indeed this is Native American country as well. Um, and they lived with them in their community. And as a Quaker, she thought that was absolutely normal. Um, this was, and she becomes a teacher, which was extraordinarily brave of her. Her parents didn't particularly want that to happen, but uh, she was also a bit of an artist. And so here's a drawing that she did of the huts that she lived in at Camp Todd as a, as a really, not just a teacher as Marilyn mentioned, but also as someone who, um, sort of um, managed the um, transfer of donated goods between all the charitable societies and the fugitives. And here is a, a picture that's uh, extraordinary of around the same time, um, uh, what it looked like. Uh, many people died because of diseases, malnutrition, um, lack of clothes, um, horrible winters. It was an awful, awful time. All right, I'm gonna go back for a minute because I'm gonna, stop there and I'm sure Marilyn we're going to circle back to you but I would love to um, now ask um, about this album. So the album comes um, up at sale at Swan Auction House in 2017 and one of the people responsible for acquiring it together with the Smithsonian was Helena Zinkum, the Director for Collections and Services and the Chief of Prints and Photographs at the Division um, of the Library of Congress. Um, so, Helena, I actually had the pleasure, uh, one of my good friends is Carla Hayden, the Librarian of Congress, and, and we both talked about this portrait of Harriet on a podcast that the Portrait Gallery does, and we both laughed about the fact that it was like, like our two worlds colliding, because um, it looks like a book, but it operates like a portrait gallery inside. Um, so what was it like for you? Walk us through what it was like discovering this album and then, um, you know, opening it up and, and really truly finding out what was inside it. Well, good evening, everyone. Very glad to be part of the group tonight. My first reaction was skepticism. And that often happens with history, doesn't it? How did we know, how could we know for sure that this was Harriet Tubman? 
And so a variety of people took different parts of the investigation. One is look at the physical photograph. Is that the right kind of photographic print, the back mount? Good news from the photographer's name, Benjamin Powelson was only in the Auburn area for two years, 1868, 1869. More good news, Harriet Tubman was in Auburn at that time. Uh, the next thing, and so we knew it wasn't a modern fake. After that, we get down to Harriet Tubman herself. And experts in her life looked at the photograph, you, you mentioned already, Kim, there was one from the early 1870s. And so by comparing the facial features between this portrait from 68, 69 to the one from the early 70s, several people weighed in to say, yes, this is Miss Tubman. Skepticism turns to awe, as so many people have said, to have even this one glimpse of Harriet Tubman in her younger years, a bit more vigor, a very elegant outfit to my eye at least. It is the year she gets married. It's the year her first biography comes out or around that time. So perhaps there's a special occasion at stake, always more to learn and discover. Beyond that, the picture, the portrait of Harriet Tubman is catching a lot of attention. And so it becomes more and more clear that the auction price, the bidding will be high. So one Friday morning, uh, actually only four days before the auction, I called Michelle Gates Morrissey at the National Museum of African American History and said, what do you think? And really neither one of us, I know it must seem, the federal government may seem at times all wealthy, but neither, NMAHC nor the Library of Congress individually had enough funding to prevail at this auction. And we were determined as best as hard as we could try and hence collaboration. Uh, we got permission from several federal agencies to combine our funding and to share this treasure. And the most dramatic moment came in that we were the successful bidders and our money would have run out in one more bid. <laughs> so I like to say, that I, I feel like the spirit of collaboration helped. The final point I'd like to make, Kim, in answer to your question is that both of us always wanted the whole album. Part of the bidding was not only about Harriet, but it was really important to have this community of people John Menard, the first African-American elected to Congress, even though he wasn't allowed to sit. The abolitionists, the many teachers, her protégés. And if it had gone back into private hands, the chances were it could have been dissembled and sold separately. So I would say skepticism, awe, determination, collaboration, and then huge relief. Because the other reason for this album to be in the stewardship of two national agencies in the United States is that we could apply all of our skills, the conservation, the digitization, the cataloging, continual consultation back and forth. And so within one year, we were able to put the album out on the public web. And now it is on physical display at the National Museum of African American History in Washington, DC. It's really extraordinary. It's really extraordinary, as you said, um, as those of um, those people who know as researchers that although there were many, many carte de visites created, it was actually the sort of the democratization of portraiture. It was the first time that you could have a camera that would intake four or eight pictures at the same time. And for as little as $20, you could get four or eight pictures in your hand. They're these small, literally, they, they used the French form of carte de visite as a visiting card, but the truth is they were never used in that way. 
And of course, super important just on the, uh, they start in 1861 at the start of the Civil War. And many uh, soldiers, of course, are found lying in the fields um, dead with these cartes de visites of their family and their loved ones on their persons. Or indeed, you know, it was the way that it actually built celebrity across uh, the country, including the portrait of Harriet as she became more and more well known. Um, so there's a sort of this fascinating moment too with this, this portable uh, album. Um, but as you said, the fact that it was together and that we knew, we know who it was owned by because of the inscription. So over time, what tended to happen was that these albums, which of which there were many, would be disassembled. Um, the marker would often consider that it was more profitable to sell the parts than to keep the whole. Um, and so I want to share again just a, a few pictures of what the remarkable work that the Library of Congress, Congress did. Um, and so you, you did put everything online. And I have to say, Helena, this actually made my dissertation because I, I started writing just when COVID hit. And if it had not been for this, I would have had to write about some other obscure topic. <laughs> I'm not sure or waited a while. Um, but it's remarkable how much information that you all did in putting the album online. And this is just a screenshot. And I really commend people because they um, it, it saved so much research and trying to, to, to work out who's there um, and the dating of each of these pictures. Um, unusual for this album too, is that album keeping was very much a, a female um, practice. I mean, men did it too, but it was something True. that you enjoyed in the parlor. Yes. And those albums looked like Bibles. So it was deliberately, yes. so you can put it next to your Bible. Um, but for most of these albums, and women would collect pictures of their family or they would collect celebrity. But for Emily, celebrity were activists. They were uh, people who were social activists trying to change the world and make it a better place. And that alone makes it rather extraordinary. There's only two carte de visites of her family. Um, and the rest are actually mostly people who were movers and shakers in the, in the reform era. Um, so there you go. There's the magic um, for researchers. Um, it was given to Carrie Nicholl, uh, a nurse in uh, Camp Todd, uh, and uh, it's dated on um, the first day of the year. So it's a New Year's present. It was very common to give presents not only at Christmas, but also in the new year to Emily Howland. And this really is what ha has helped all of us um, immeasurably. Um, but this is what it looks like. Again, as you can see, was um, there was it was kind of the present that you would give. It was kind of the trendy present to give to somebody. So, um, and uh, I know from my research and and some other work at the Howland Stone Store Museum, Emily loved photographs and portraiture. So um, Carrie knew her subject well when she gave this album, and then it had to be filled over time. But you can see how beautiful it is. And this picture, I imagine, Helena, was taken before you all had a hand in it because it looks like it's a little bit rough and ready around the edges. Exactly, Kim. And for everyone, I'll, I'll put in the chat the link to where you all can see the pictures online. Yeah, and you can see them working on it. It's just this extraordinary. And you can, I think, also see the size of it. It was literally was something that you could carry around and hold in your hand. Yes, they're six by five inches, so it, it's quite a small album. It, and to underscore one of the points you made, Kim, uh, these albums did not exist before 1861. That's when they hit the American shore and patented. So this is within two or three years, truly new fashion, new technology, new opportunity. And at least for me, I sometimes look at old historical pictures and think, how old fashioned, and I need to jog myself into that time. No, these are very up to date and current people. And I'll put a link to a book that is all about these uh, carte de visite albums and how they were very much uh, the activity of the day, uh, sold to women in fashion magazines as well as in other sources. So if you'd like to read more about it. Really Thanks. extraordinary. So Ashley, um, so let's talk about the relationship between Harriet and Emily. Uh, as I said, uh, one of the remarkable things about Emily is that she uh, made friends 
in the African American community. She grew up with, um, you know, uh, freed fugitives from slavery in her community. Um, and but she really uh, filled her album also with uh, portraits of African Americans that she knew personally. It wasn't some sort of fetishization, as we know often white women would put in pictures of you know slaves or something in a in a very different format. But but Emily didn't. Um, and she and she in one case particularly she knew Emma Brown very well, who um, as Marilyn pointed out, um, was first a pupil and then actually became an assistant teacher with her in Matilda Minor's Normal School for Coloured Girls. They both became teachers. Um, so, you know, how significant was it that Emily had this friendship with Harriet and indeed sort of was very, um, you know, an ally, I would say, to these women, uh, particularly um, also as, you know, they were fighting the fight in terms of abolition, but also in terms of education and suffrage. Yeah, thank you so much, Kim. Um, I'm really happy to be here. And hi, mom. Uh, thank <laughs> you for coming. Hi, mom. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Kim, what I love about researching and sharing stories about women in history is that time and time again, we see this disruption of this single hero narrative that we sometimes see with like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln. Um, and it's really about friendships. When we're talking about women's history, a lot of the time we're really talking about communities and groups and friendships. So when we're looking at the relationship between Harriet Tubman and Emily Howland and all the amazing things that they accomplished during their lives, while they're both brilliant women, they're very much connected to groups or communities that were connected to a shared vision um, and supporting one another, right? A big part of this is supporting one another. That's really important to sort of think about. Um, they understood of sort of what we would call, like you said, Kim, sort of an allyship, the importance of allyship and that they needed each other to get things accomplished. So what I really love about their relationship is that, you know, there are so many things that sort of tie them together, right? Their fight against slavery, um, their shared faith, right? That's a really big part of the both of them and sort of how they were raised, um, but also what sort of got them through really tough times. And sort of thinking about how they're both committed in their wish to see African-Americans be granted the same freedoms and opportunities as those as white Americans. Um, but what I think is also really interesting is that, you know, when we're thinking about um, Emily Howland and Harriet Tubman, I think it's also important to recognize sort of the threat of violence that, support, that surrounded both of them, right? They're doing very dangerous yes. work. They're yeah. both at risk, right, of, of, of terror, of, of being ostracized. And the fact that they both did that work in spite of that, I think is really important to remember, right? And that trust between the two of them. I think, you know, this interracial friendship is really a great example of sort of what they shared um, and how important that was, that trust was, what they had. Um, and I think it says a lot that Harriet Tubman had great fondness and respect for Emily Howland. And I would expect, you know, during their friendship, there's a lot of information being exchanged, right? I think I wouldn't be surprised if Emily learned a lot about the lives of enslaved or formerly enslaved people through her interactions with Harriet Tubman. And I also wouldn't be surprised if this helped fuel the inspiring work that Emily did, right? A big part of it, as you all mentioned, promoting literacy through the creation of schools and also supporting other Black institutions through her philanthropy. You know, I think that it's super important to consider the ways in which racism created so many barriers for free and enslaved people. And so these these collaborations, these allies become really important financially, socially, and politically in all the ways in between. And so you mentioned um, Emma Brown, right? This is an example of Emily Howland. We would, in the 21st century, we would say using her privilege, right? Um, to be able to make pathways for other African-Americans. So what's really, to me, what's so special about that tiny, tiny book is that this is an example of that. It shows that, right? It shows the things that Emily Howland had done and the people that she reached and the ways in which they were able to come together to make this really significant impact in American history. I, I do have to say, though, you know, I, I think we have to be really clear-eyed about this. You know, Emily was still um, a woman of her time. 
Um, you know, even when Harriet dies, she refers to her as Aunt Harriet, right? Yes. And it's the uncle, uncle so-and-so or Aunt Harriet, which is really a sort of pejorative. Well, she didn't think it that way. This sort of is an endearing, a term of endearance, but it's really a very maternalistic usage of somebody's, you know, uh, name. And and I also often wonder, you know, Emily put so much stake in education. I'm sure she must have been frustrated because Frederick Douglass was frustrated with Harriet for not learning to read, right? He was furious with Harriet for not making more of an effort. I think now we probably realize that Harriet likely had some learning disability because she did get, you know, um, hit in the head very young and, and, and as a result had visions. And so there, there may have been many other reasons why she was illiterate. Um, but, and, and so, you know, this was not an equal relationship. I don't think we should ever imagine that it was, but, and yet, you know, Emily, I think did make an effort and she did sort of, again, to your sense is this idea of, you know, under the, the, the tent of Christianity and faith and, 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 and holding each other up, um, which played such a, an important role. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think you're super spot on, Kim, by really recognizing possible power dynamics between these two women, right? And sort of understanding how that dynamic would have played out in different ways, um, but both recognizing the complexities of this friendship, right? To sort of recognize why it's so significant and important, but to also be really cognizant of the time in which these two women were living, so... Yeah, and you know, Emily could be very judgmental um, it, it, when she had a long standing relationship with Emma Brown. But then when Emma decided to get married, uh, like a lot of these fierce women, including Susan B. Anthony, they sort of lost their luster <laughs> in their eyes. And she sort of dropped off the relationship a little bit. And I think, and this is sort of, uh, you know, Emily very purposely said, I refuse to get married because I'm going to dedicate myself to sort of humankind. And I know that, you know, I don't think she, um, she didn't bemoan anyone the fact that they chose that path, but she she certainly saw, thought less of them, I think in some ways. Um, or maybe just that it, the, the idea was that somehow you now couldn't be as dedicated to the cause of, of women's suffrage. Um, both of them were also huge temperance advocates, you know, and this goes hand in hand. And I think we often forget with the women's movement was also about um, countervailing the ill effects of um, masculine power, which was when it, you mention violence that often is linked to alcohol. Right. And and um, and so that's sort of also interesting, I think, as well. Um, yeah. let's, let's look at some of the pictures. Um, so I'll pull this up again to share the screen. So this is what, um, this is what it looks like in the book. And I have to say one of the other things I find fascinating, but I couldn't really prove anything is that all the portraits of the African Americans are in the last quarter of the book. They're not in the start. And I wonder whether that is also some kind of an unconscious bias, you know, sort of the back of the bus, but back of the album, or whether it is some kind of chronological layout. Um, and as we know, there's this moment that Marilyn talks about where Emily is actually literally saved because she gets um, sort of attacked on the side of a, uh, a road near um, the Slocum's um, farm in uh, after the Civil War in the 1870s and taken in and this and so, you know, maybe it's somewhat chronological, but I do find it extraordinarily interesting that Harriet is the last page of this. And more to the point, then there is this, this, this picture tucked in the back. Um, one of the things that people often talk about Harriet is that, you know, she was of course um, a fugitive and then she was a freedom fighter. She brought, and she went back down under the Mason Dixon line, brought families, you know, an estimated 70 more people back to freedom. Uh, she was a spy, she was, uh, you know, many things, but she was also a nurse. Um, and in some, there was, this is pre-nurse uniform, but if you compare this picture with the picture in the album with um, Carrie Nichols, there's a, there's a great similarity because nurses also had hats to keep their uh, face out of the sun. Um, they're often standing, holding chairs for some unknown reason. Um, but there she is. Um, and, and often when you do a search on, you know, Harriet as a nurse, um, that's, that's the picture that will turn up. And it's probably, you know, of course, dated a little later, but, but still kind of interesting. 
Um, so this is, um, I, I thought it was interesting again to put these pairings that come into the album. We know for a fact that Emily did curate the album. She purposely made these pairings. Um, however, I will say that we don't know whether they all um, stayed that way because the album, of course, has come to light many years after her death. Um, but we do know that she wrote, um, it's her handwriting, and here is Emma Brown looking really rather wonderful opposite. And if anyone in the audience knows who this unknown woman is, I think three different institutions would be thrilled to know. <laughs> Portrait Gallery Library Company and the African American Museum would love to know who this woman is. But there's Emma, Emma, and underneath, um, you know, you would slot the, the carte de visites into the, the sleeves of the album, um, is actually written Emma V. Brown, My Pupil and Friend. And, um, and Emily made it possible for Emma to go to Oberlin College. Um, she wanted her to get a college education. Unfortunately, Emma's health was not good, but she did go on to, in fact, be um, the first um, teacher of an, uh, a public African-American school in uh, Washington, DC. Um, again, and these two are facing each other, which I find is fascinating. This is Susie Bruce, who she also knew as a student in Matilda Minor School, um, facing uh, Senator John Willis Maynard, who we have no record on whether she met Maynard, but it's highly likely because as, um, as Marilyn mentioned, she you know, knew the, um, Senator Seward. Um, she often went up to the Hill to listen to arguments that were being made. Um, and I think it would, uh, she, she most likely did meet him. Um, this is the postcard that I believe is in the collection of the Howland Stone Store Museum. Emily was in Montgomery, Alabama when she received news from Stella Phillips, one of the children of the freed families that did in fact settle in Sherwood, telling them that, and it's, I know it's hard to read here, but it says, um, Aunt Harriet Tubman has passed away. Later on, uh, the New York Age prints in full what happens at a memorial to Harriet in, um, in 1913. Uh, you can see it, it spans two pages. Uh, it's on the cover page, it's on the second page, and mentions that, um, that Emily is in the audience. Um, and in fact, Booker T. Washington is one of the speakers and he calls her out specifically. He mentions that, um, that Emily has been an ally to African-Americans and, and, and we know also she substantially supported the um, establishment of the Tuskegee Institute. Um, I also think it's fascinating uh, that you see on this front page, um, this drawing of educating African-Americans. Uh, this was actually a black paper, one of the leading um, papers for African-Americans. It says the path is open to all of us. And this is something that Emily devoutly believed herself. Um, in the paper, it mentions this um, plaque um, and the wording of the plaque. Here you can see what the plaque looks like. And I believe today it's still on the outside of the Cayuga County Courthouse. Um, so I'm going to um, stop sharing and then this is sort of more open, free conversation. How are we doing for time? I think we're good. I wanted to circle um, back to Marilyn because Marilyn, I, I think I cut you off a little bit, but I wanted to really ask you as once we'd gone through all of this uh, to talk about the fact that Emily was a Quaker. Um, and of course, Harriet attended both the Baptist and Episcopal churches, especially the St. James AME Zion Church in upstate New York. But how do you think um, Emily's being a Quaker really affected her worldview and this relationship she had with Harriet? Um, it, I, I believe it was very important in a very kind of underlying way. Emily did not always go to meeting every week as an adult by any means. Uh, and she was open to looking at various different philosophies of religion, transcendentalism and other things, but she always came back to um, her belief in the simplicity of the Quaker outlook where each person had this inner light. And I believe she probably believed in her own inner light and in Harriet's inner light, but I, that just sort of 
made her feel that she in fact had a call probably to do the work that she did. Uh, and while it's hard to say, she throughout her life used the formal thee and thou language. She always tried to center herself uh, on Quaker, the Quaker value of the individual and, and their, their value in the and in creating a larger community, which she brought people into, I think. Yeah, um, I have a picture here. Uh, again, to just give um, people an insight, this was the, um, the North Street Meeting House where the Slocum family actually worshipped. Uh, and the, it was called a storm center for reformers because they would bring all sorts of, um, you know, uh, abolitionists before the war and then sort of social activists after the war to come and speak in the round. But you also got the sense, as uh, she said, it was, it you would sit in silence the whole time until somebody would decide to stand up because they felt um, God's calling to them. And then they would say what was in their heart. Um, and I've actually uh, suggested that it's a little bit like looking at a photo album where you're in silent and suddenly, you know, someone presents themselves. But uh, she writes at one point, she was frustrated with the Quaker religion, at one point was very drawn to the universalist religion, um, but never left it because I think she saw the value also in silence and deep thinking and, and, and friendship. But as you said, also this idea that everyone has an inner light, no matter who you are, no matter the color of your skin, your gender, where you're from, um, you are all under, you know, sort of God's inner light and, and protection. Uh, which I think is is sort of um, great. Oh, sorry, I'm sharing it now. Can you see that? So there's the, the preparatory meeting house on the left. And these are some of her friends that were posing what it was like to actually, and on one side, by the way, was the women's side and the other side was the men. They were segregated in congregationally. Um, you know, uh, this also, I think, goes to the earlier point that Ashley was making. And in fact, Marilyn, you were making that she was part of this large women's network um, uh, and so they got sustenance and friendship from each other in the cause. Um, let's go to the next slide. I think let's just talk about this. Um, so Ashley, uh, one of the things that we also know is that um, both women were fierce suffragists. Um, unfortunately, um, Harriet died before we got the 19th Amendment, right, in 1920. Um, Luckily, Emily did get to cast her vote. She said it was one of the best days of her life. But we have no pictures of um, Harriet associated with the women's suffrage movement. Um, but we do, of course, um, a, a friend, and they were in the same social circles. Um, we see Emily here with Susan B. Anthony. And in fact, if you can see my, um, my mouse, here she is in, in the back row of this group of state presidents um, at a convention in 1891 for the for the for the women's movement, um, what do you think that says about the relationship between Harriet and Emily too? I guess at the end of the day, you know, sort of uh, an enemy of my enemy is you, you're my friend, right? So it, they're both in a way fighting against sort of the patriarchy. Yes, I definitely agree. And I want to also point back to what you said earlier, Kim, was there are a lot of ties between the temperance movement and the abolitionist movement. So a lot of those women that were heavily involved, like Susan B. Anthony, um, you know, and um, oh my goodness, these, these, oh my goodness, Susan B. Anthony's partner. Oh yeah, my goodness. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, they were all one, they were all there together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so a lot of these people ended up really being involved in multiple movements all at once. So this transition to the suffrage movement makes complete sense um, to me because a big part of it is thinking about this larger issue of equality, right? Um, and who has the ability to make decisions, right? So not just being able, so it moved from who can be free to who can actually make sort of these big decisions in terms of how people live and what they do and where they can go to school, right? Um, and so I think a part of that really brings back to the idea of these women being really heavily involved in the day-to-day -day lives of the people in their communities and seeing the, the right to vote as a way to leverage sort of more power um, and how these, how these different decisions get made. Yeah. 
So Helena, you know, um, as someone who runs the prints and photographs division at the Library of Congress, I wanted to get your feedback on these two portraits. And, you know, self, um, uh, I, I guess, somewhat selfishly, I want you to tell us how important portraiture is <laughs> as the director of the National Portrait Gallery. But I find this is kind of fascinating. It also shows you the transition of technology and how photography is making it possible for these women to be seen, right, in a way that they never would have been able to had they not. So you see on the left-hand side, side a tintype, which was a one-off. You only, there was only one tintype created. That was the early technology of Emily Howland. It's in the collection of the, um, the Friends of Historical Library at Swarthmore. Uh, and she, you know, she would have, uh, this is the year that she actually receives the album. Um, and you can see she's somewhat businesslike. Um, she's got her, the, the, the chain around her neck that would hold your keys. And um, you know, that was very useful. You could carry a whole lot of things around your neck. Um, at Chatelaine, I think it was called. Um, but she's still, you know, a, a little bit sort of dressed up, but she's still keeping to the somber dress of the Quaker. And then you have this extraordinary picture, this carte de visite, of which we can only imagine there must be a number of them out there because they were never single. There were at least three others, I would think. They were taken in fours or eights, sometimes twelves from a camera of Harriet Tubman at around the same time, about four years later. When you see these two compared, what's, what is your thinking as a, as, a, as a researcher of prints and photographs? I come back time after time, Kim, to the idea that photographs are windows into history and windows into people's lives. It's speculative, a fair amount of it, frankly. But the fact, the difference for me between say portrait painting and photography is that there is a, can, can be a directness of communication. It often feels as if people are looking straight into the camera and their stances, here I am. There's a great similarity in the way these two women look into the camera. They're not frozen in their expression. Back to here I am and make of me what you will. I'm a person on the earth. I'm making a difference. People love looking at people. I'm veering off in a slightly different direction here, but back to why portraiture matters so much in telling historical stories. We can read letters, newspapers, but the tangible qualities and the degree to which people from the past look very much like people today. Uh, so I, I find both portraits impressive. The photographers are fairly skillful. Emily Howland is a little askew in her frame, uh, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day. They're, they're powerful pictures and the fact that they're from almost the same year is so unusual. Mm. And I did want to mention, Kim, that the Boston Athenaeum, this was a recent discovery for me, they acquired a pair of these carte de visite albums that belonged to Harriet Hayden, an African-American abolitionist in Boston. And I think the audience this evening, if you would like to see more carts de visite of how African-Americans presented themselves to the camera, this is an album uh, rich, filled. It's actually two volumes, so it's a bit larger than Emily Howland. I'll put the link in. That would be great. But I very much appreciate your pointing out that there are different qualities of portraiture available and possible. So I wanted to pop this up to just to your point, Helena, at one point, I think you mentioned that just the huge interest when Harriet's young self presented itself to all of us, suddenly we could imagine this woman that we'd all heard about because we've had pictures of her, but really in her seventies and even older where she really doesn't look like the woman who was crossing multiple times across you know, the, the, the boundary of slavery and bringing people back and, and just, you know, wielding a gun and all the rest of it. Now, here she is, right? 
Um, and I think it's, um, I had the great pleasure of actually interviewing Casey Lemons, the director of the Harriet movie and asking her because I was so excited about this little vignette in the movie. Um, they, they sort of make take liberal, um, liberal use of history because they have her um, in Philadelphia taking this, this picture um, and we know that wouldn't have happened. It happened in Auburn, but anyway, let's uh, with the Still brothers. She's she's at the Stills, who were you know on the Underground Railroad, and she takes this picture, um, uh, and that couldn't have happened. We know that's not true, but but regardless, um, what a wonderful recreation of the Carte de Visite in film. And then most recently, and if you go to the African American Museum, you, you can go down to the first floor and see the Emily Howland album, and then go to the top floor where there is an exhibition in tribute to Breonna Taylor. And, um, and you'll see this is facing the portrait of Breonna Taylor by, Emily, uh, by Amy Sherald by Beza Butler. And you can see that she again has been hugely sort of inspired by the, the young Harriet's image. So I think this to me is always so fascinating how sort of culture just keeps these layers keep going and going and going. Um, I'm gonna do just the last little, let me see where we are here. Um, so there it is. That's what it looks like on view right now at the African-American Museum. And I think actually, if I go back, there's Emily casting her vote. This is a picture at, um, at, at Swarthmore at the Friends Library. And this is her um, tombstone uh, just nearby where she lived in Sherwood. Um, so I'm gonna stop the share and I'm going to um, uh, open, uh, there's a couple of questions have come in through the chat. Uh, one of them is um, a lot of, a number of people have said that they thought that um, Susan B. Anthony was in fact against black women having the vote. Um, would someone like to answer that? Um, I can tell you what I know, but I'll open it up for conversation. I, I might say something. Susan had her moments uh, <laughs> because she was, she, was, she was furious when black men got the vote and women didn't. She was just right. beside herself. And, I think it says something about Emily that she was able to maintain her relationship with Susan B. Anthony while not really uh, agreeing with her. Uh, one other thing about as Susan kind of softened her view, but when she was asked by Emily's niece, Isabel, if they could have, um, I think it was the wife of, uh, one of the teachers, somebody from Tuskegee come to one of the uh, conventions to speak. She, she didn't, she wasn't against it, but she wanted to make sure they were the perfect example of their race if she was going to have somebody come. So she, she has a hard time, even though she has a Quaker background herself in kind of overcoming latent racism, I guess. Yeah, I think that's a very good answer. She was, I mean, she, she definitely, um, I would say, was racist, but um, it, it was a, an uneasy, you know, there, there was a lot of um, use to work, to walking step by step um, with, abol with abolition, of course, until such time that it, it wasn't useful anymore for, for her particular cause. And it's, it's sort of too bad. And it certainly has tainted, um, I think, her legacy. We also know from an exhibition that we did at the at the Portrait Gallery that the history of the women's movement and the 19th Amendment was largely told only through the, the, the two volume story of, um, of women's suffrage written by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton that left all the women of color out conveniently. And as you know, if you write the history it often becomes the history, even though it's erroneous. So um, we went to a great pains, um, thanks to Kate LeMay, uh, our historian and other scholars to, to put the women of color back into the picture um, uh, who, you know, they were very much um, um, there. So uh, yeah, it's too bad. Um, Kim, I, uh, I just ahead. want to jump in. Did, yeah. and we, but we do know that um, both uh, Anthony and Tubman were contemporaries, right? Like they did right. share similar yep. circles and friends and Harriet was involved in suffrage. So, I mean, their paths probably crossed. Oh, yes, no, absolutely. They, they absolutely knew each other. 
Um, and there are letters actually about uh, Susan B. Anthony talking about Tubman and, and, and seeing her and they, they, they knew each other. But um, again, to that earlier conversation, I, I don't believe um, uh, Anthony saw herself as an, um, or Anthony did not see Tubman as an equal, let's put it that way, right? So socially, educationally, economically, in, in any sort of way. Yeah. Um, are there other uh, things that any of you have, have thought about um, that you, you wanted to bring up at this moment? And if there are other questions in the chat. Um, well, I think, you know, one of the things I would say, and there was a question about Emily's uh, philanthropy, um, you know, upon um, Slocum's death, he left her about $1.3 million and a number of properties. She was in those days quite a wealthy woman. Um, I suspect, um, and I've been meaning to write about this, that one of the reasons that she hasn't got her due, and in fact, the only person who actually has written substantially about Emily was a woman called Judith Brio back in 1974. And it's a, it's a very skewed and strange thing because she sort of casts her in this feminist light and, and applies Freudian theory, if you can believe it, uh, to, to Emily's life. She basically suggests the fact that Emily decided not to keep going with the women's movement and go back home to look after her father until he dies shows an Oedipal complex. So there's the 70s for you. Um, what I what actually happened was that she started operating quite the little sort of support network out of this giant house that I sh showed earlier. And in fact, women who were on the, the, the circuit to talk about suffrage would come and stay. And so her house was full of teachers. Um, you know, women could come and, and stay for a long period of time and, and Emily would feed them, but she was also handing out lots of money, mostly to um, African-American industrial schools down south. She very much believed, as, as Marilyn mentioned earlier, in um, education and also land reform. She truly believed that, um, that once enslaved people should have uh, land repatriated to them so that they could actually economically stand on their own uh, two feet. Um, and so she supported many, many causes. Um, not only did Susan B. Anthony say that she was her single largest donor, but I believe Frederick Douglass mentioned at Booker T. Washington, absolutely. Um, so she supported a lot of um, educational schools um, uh, across the country. She set up at least two schools that have her name on them. Um, and so it's sort of this amazing woman. But my theory is that one of the reasons she hasn't got credit was that she, um, you know, there are, there's been a sort of, I would say, bias against women who give away money, especially when it's not money they made themselves. She inherited it from her father. I think it's sort of fascinating now when you see people like Mackenzie Scott giving away so much money and getting credit for, for that. Um, but previously, you know, wealthy women, uh, even if they were like Rockefellers or whatever, were not really credited with, with agency in, in giving away the money. It was, it was their husbands, it was their fathers, it was their, you know, their, their relatives. And I think that's actually a whole other interesting kind of question to ask yourself is, you know, why has, you know, maybe I could ask that of the three of you, why don't we know more about Emily? Why is it only taking the discovery of this album? to learn more about Emily. I don't know, Marilyn, do you have an opinion? Um, well, I have, I have a couple of things I want to say about her giving away money. Um, I, she inherited a great deal of money, but she was extremely careful. And her father had, had uh, invested in railroads at the time when they were growing. So that's where it came from. But she was very careful with that money. She acted as a bank director uh, and she, gave away money but she also kept enough so it would keep growing she many women philanthropists of the time had the problem where they they themselves could not manage money and she was actually excellent at managing money um in ter i forgot what harriet you're was not by the way harriet was oh, terrible well, no, at managing harriet money. just gave everything away as soon as she <laughs> got it all the time uh, and it's and she took everybody in even, even the Cuga home for children, 
had they came up with a black child from somewhere and they immediately called Harriet to see if Harriet would would come and take care of this child, which she did, of course. Um, Ashley or Helena, why don't we know more about Emily Howland? Well, I mean, as someone who studies women's history for a living, I think it's always been so much easier to cling to one or two stories. I mean, it's 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 almost the American story, right? To cling to one or two sort of mythic heroes to sort of really stick with it. Um, but I think, you know, especially with what happened last year, I think it's really important that we open up space to different stories because one, it shows that women are complicated and you know they're complex and it's and it's okay um but i think also i mean these different stories give us a different perspective of the movement and i think you know including someone like emily howland would provide a really different perspective of women in the suffrage movement one that i think is is really needed um, at this point and i think also thinking about harriet tubman too thinking about how a lot of the women of color that we know who are associated with suffrage are educated women. And so what does it mean that Harriet Tubman, someone who was not sort of traditionally educated or could not read or write, um, has not really gotten her due either in terms of being one of the faces of the suffrage movement? I mean, I think one of the interesting things with Harriet is, um, you know, there's a whole um, body of, of, of research that says that I mean, she was an amazing public speaker. She was a great orator, but she also really understood the power of her image. And she she very much um, cared about the portraits of her. She posted them deliberately. She, she gave them away. And she understood that that was some way that she could have control, which I think is actually, a, um, you know, a, a really powerful way to, to manage your own image and your own. But of course, the books that were written, um, so called by her, were written for her and, and have their own biases, right? So Sarah Bradford's book of Harriet is very much Sarah Bradford, a white woman's version of what Harriet is telling her. And, and I'm sure, you know, not what Harriet would have wanted for herself. But so to your point, I think what's also interesting is that and even that picture of Emily in the large um, group um, of other suffragists, she's at the back. Um, and so she's supporting them financially, but she's not the loudest voice in the room and therefore doesn't become one of the sheroes, right? Helena, would you like, uh, have you got anything else you'd like to add to this? Uh, I think you've just captured my sense of it, Kim, that sometimes when people are reliable, loyal, ever-present, but not the people in the front row, not the people giving the major speeches. And there was a part of me that wondered if she almost lived too long. Mm. It, I, can't, I can't quite capture it, but sometimes there's a moment and the fame builds. And then there can also be a moment where you simply accept a person and don't, you know, she, she, they're great eulogies when she dies. I don't mean to say she's neglected. Perhaps it's that she was active in multiple spheres. Mm -hmm. She has her banking side. Some of her letters go to Cornell, some go to Swarthmore. There's a fragmentation. And I've, I've wondered if that might have helped to dim the light spotlight from her. And it's terrific, of course, that she comes back. Your mention of railroad money, it, it's a bit of a digression, but Mary Elizabeth Garrett in Baltimore, that's Baltimore and Ohio money, wanted badly to have a PhD. She's working at the end of the 1800s, but she banded together with three women in Baltimore, and they made sure that the Johns Hopkins Medical School could open because they gave, donated the last piece of money that was needed. And here was their condition. Can you guess? Women. women. That medical school would admit women. Would admit women. No question about it. No. So that sense of pride in, yes, women, there were women who could manage money and leverage it to very positive outcomes. In the same way that Harriet Tubman leverages her fundamental caring for people and her strength and her spirit. There's not one way to succeed. 
So someone in the chat has mentioned this um, desire I think we all have that we finally see Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill. <laughs> Maybe, what do you think? Um, would uh, Marilyn, would you put the, would, would you put this, the younger Harriet or would you do the older Harriet on the $20? How, what's your feeling on, about this? Uh, I almost, I like the image of the younger one, but I think more people recognize the picture of her as an older person and you want people to recognize her. So I guess I'd have to see what kind of a job they did in, in engraving and making things look good. But, but the younger one would be nice. I mean, because it is a, a little more shows the dy how dynamic she was and a little more active. But. Ashley, younger or older? Oh my gosh, Kim. Um, I just actually spent some time working with teachers talking about the Bisa Butler portrait of Harriet oh, Tubman. Yeah. Yeah. Oh so goodness. I'm actually going to go with younger because I think sometimes the myth of Harriet Tubman gets in our way of seeing her as a human being. And so I like the younger portrait um, because it shows her at a really interesting time in her life. Helena? You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Kim. <laughs> uh, I would love to see the younger portrait or an engraving from a portion of it on the $20 bill. Uh, the future is longer than the past. Well, maybe our paper money will be turning into something <laughs> else, but let's introduce the world to new aspects of history. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I think I'm going to just um, wrap it up there. I know we're a little bit ahead of time, but I'm, I'm sure people would appreciate having a few minutes left. There was maybe one question about um, what's been the most rewarding part of learning about the intersecting lives of these two remarkable women. I think from my perspective, it never stops. I mean, I think, you know, it, it kind of, and I think this is both uh, uh, from my perspective, from where I stand, the power of portraiture, because even though a portrait might have been created in, you know, uh, 1864, um, it's as, as contemporary as when you're actually looking at it today and you're bringing your modern sensibilities and your own biases and your cultural baggage to the table. And then of course, then trying to fill in the pictures and see what other people are, are finding. I think we're always learning something new about, um, about the characters of history, we, we will never understand it. We should never actually pretend that we can put ourselves in, in those places. Um, and it's, it's always fascinating, I think, to have conversations like this with others who, who bring a, another viewpoint to uh, these, these, uh, these characters, um, to these biographies. Um, it's sort of central to my world, as, as Ashley says, central to hers. Helena, you, you're coming at it. Um, at a very interesting perspective too at the Library of Congress. Um, and Marilyn, but you're really so much focused on, on, on this, the Howland um, uh, family, the, the area. I mean, I really would commend everyone if they have a moment, it's a beautiful part of the world to go see the Howland Stone Store Museum. Um, and it's in Sherwood and um, it's, it's just extraordinary. And um, Emily and her um, niece, um, were um, Isabel were were collectors. I, I think there was there wasn't anything that they didn't see on their travels. They didn't believe they had to bring back home to Sherwood, and so much of that collection from all their travels around the world can actually be found at the Howland Stone Store Museum. So it's extraordinary. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you to everybody who uh, listened in. Uh, Natalie, is there anything else from your perspective? Any questions? I think I speak for all of us when I say that this has been an absolutely wonderful, enlightening panel discussion. And I'm so, so grateful to each of you for joining us today and everybody who joined us as well. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed myself and feel like I learned a lot, which is a lot because I felt like I know so much about all these women. Um, and so thank you all, Kim. Thank you for moderating. Ashley, Helena, Marilyn, thank you for participating. Um, if to everybody, I'll be sending links tomorrow with every article we talked about, every book that was mentioned. You will have the links to it in the email that is sent to you tomorrow, as well as a recording. So if you want to watch it again or didn't catch something, you can go back and check it. 
Um, otherwise, um, please stay tuned for more programs like this that the National Women's Hall of Fame will be doing in the next year. Um, and so stay in touch, follow us on social media at womenofthehall.org. And um, you'll be getting a survey after this once we are done. Please fill it out. It really does help us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And have a wonderful night, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.